I want to talk from the thought that it's time for transition. It's time for a transition. It's time for a change. Allow me to read just two verses that I read in your hearing. Um, Romans chapter 12. Paul writes, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Consecrate me now to the service, Lord, by the power of your grace divine. Let my soul look up with a steadfast hope, and my will be lost in thine. Draw me nearer, nearer, precious Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. Now, O God, allow the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart to be found acceptable in thy sight. It's in the strong name of Jesus the Christ, we pray. Amen. It's time for transformation, or it's time for a change. The theme for our 110th anniversary is the church striving to be transformed with the love of God. What is transformation? I'm glad you asked that question. The Webster Dictionary defines transformation as change in form, appearance, nature, or character. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 17 and 18, he says, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's mercy are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is spirit. Eugene Peterson puts it this way in the Message Bible. He says, they suddenly recognize that God is a living personal presence, not a piece of chiseled stone. And when God is personally present, a living spirit, that old constricting legislation is recognized as obsolete. We are free of it, all of us. Nothing between us and God. Our face is shining with the brightness of his face. And so we are transformed, much like the Messiah. Our lives gradually become brighter and more beautiful as God enters our lives and we become like him. I heard Dr. Taylor say at one point that when we get to heaven, we would have been so transformed that people will not be able to tell the difference between us and Jesus. We'll be so much the same. There are those who say mature people can't change, or old folk can't change, or you can't teach an old dog new tricks. This simply is not true. Paul argues in 2 Corinthians verse 17, chapter 5, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, and the new is here. Our forefathers and mothers didn't know a whole lot about the term transformation or metamorphosis, but they knew that when they got good religion, they had been changed. And they were saying, I looked at my hands, and my hands look new. I looked at my feet and they did too. It's been a great change since I've been born again. We take members into the church. We're happy to get folk, but we do not have a lot of conversation and discussion about what it means to be born again. I heard Jesus say to Nicodemus, marvel not, don't be surprised that I say to you, you must be, you got to be, born again. We are called, in a sense, as the butterfly 
to be changed, to have a metamorphosis. As I've shared with you, I watch a lot of nature shows and I was studying the butterfly. We were in, um, I guess it was the Bahamas, one of the islands, and we went to a butterfly farm. You need to understand that the first stage of the butterfly is the egg. And when you look at the egg of a butterfly egg, you can see the little butterfly inside the egg is in there. And that's why it's so important that we plant the right seeds into our children, the right information, the right word. The second stage is when the egg hatches, you would expect to see a butterfly. But what you see really is a caterpillar, looks like a worm. In this stage, the caterpillar begins to eat the leaf that it is born into. And as we grow, we should eat the word of God. We should eat the book. We should study the book. We should be in Sunday school. We should be in Bible study. The third stage of the butterfly is the coolest. The butterfly forms into what is called a pupa or a chrysalis. Here the butterfly appears to be resting. It is in the cocoon. And it seems like nothing is happening, but it's in this stage that real transformation takes place. And I want to suggest, as I'm learning now, that transformation takes place when you spend time alone with God in prayer and meditation. I'm finding that as I talk to him, as I spend time with him, as I meditate on his word, as, as I look to see him in the sunrise and the sunset and the flowers and in the trees, I get closer to him. And I find myself singing the song with more meaning. I come to the garden alone to pray while the dew is still on the roses and the voice I hear falling on my ear is the Son of God discloses. Sometimes he walks with me and sometimes he talks with me and every now and then have the calm assurance that I belong to him and he belongs to me. The fourth stage is when the butterfly emerges and comes out as a butterfly. Now it has to continue to eat. It has to continue to exercise its wings so that it can become stronger and reach its full potential. I want to say to us as a church, it's time for the church to be transformed. We have studied the word. We have had praise and worship. We have heard some excellent preaching and teaching. We have attended seminars and conventions. And some of us have gone on mission trips. But the time has come for us to be transformed to the end that when people see us, they see Jesus. Paul, Paul writes, he, he says, um, it, it may sound, he says in, 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 in the third Corinthians chapter, verses one to three, I'm paraphrasing, he says, does it sound like we're patting ourselves on the back and insisting on our own credentials, asserting our authority? He says, well, we're not. He says, neither do we need letters of endorsements either to you or from you. You yourselves are all the endorsements we need. He says, your very lives are a letter that anyone can read by just looking at you. Christ himself wrote it, not with ink, but with God's living spirit, not chiseled into stone, but carved into human lives. And we publish it. In other words, Paul says in the King James Version, we are living epistles. Uh, we are not written on with ink as you write on paper, but God has written in us with the spirit in our hearts so that when folks see us, they see Jesus. I believe that Paul's letter to the Romans is designed to teach us how we can be transformed to the end that when people see us, they will indeed see Jesus. Those of you who have been coming to Bible study now, we're all in Bible study now, I want to suggest that the letter of Romans is perhaps the best written and Paul's most informative letter of all of his writings. This letter is considered the apostle's opus cata, the great letter. In this letter, 
of Romans, we find the doctrines of the church, the doctrine of sanctification, which means to be set apart. Um, we don't like to talk about being sanctified, but the old folk, you had to be sanctified. Something had to happen that, so that we were set apart. We weren't trying to behave like everybody else because we had spent time with Jesus. The, the, the doctrine of justification is in this letter where Paul has us to understand that we are justified by Christ. That's why we pray in the name of Jesus, because in our sinful state, we cannot stand justified. But the one who is righteous, the one who knew no sin and became sin for us, he stands as the righteous judge. And so God no longer sees us in our sinful state, but he sees Jesus, the doctrine of justification, the doctrine of salvation. Um, we are saved because of the blood of Jesus the Christ. Um, what can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can cleanse and make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners like you and I plunge beneath that flow, lose all our guilty stains. We are saved by grace, not by works, lest any man should boast. And then when Paul gets to chapter 12, uh, I'm almost done, believe it or not, he, 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 make, he makes a fast turn. He gives us a blueprint of how we ought to behave as Christians who have come into a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. If you're taking notes, uh, first he suggests that we need to get a new vision. We need to look at things from a different perspective. That's how sometimes um, your mind can change about a person or about a situation and folk don't know how you came to that change. But if you spend time with Jesus, he helps you to know that it's not about you and what you think and your ego, but it's about him who is called Preach James out of darkness into the marvelous light. And so Paul, Paul, Paul writes, and this is how you get a new vision. He says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, uh, we're here not because we've been that good, neither have we kept his commandments that well, but it's only because of his mercy. It's only because he did not give us the sentence that we deserve because the Bible says that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. But God had mercy on us and gave us another chance. He says, because of all that God has done for us, through Christ, we should offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. This is your true and perfect worship. In other words, um, the greatest praise is not hallelujah. The greatest praise is not speaking in tongues. The greatest praise is not how well you can sing so that somebody can feel a chill running down their spine, but the greatest praise that you can give God is the life, a living sacrifice. As growing and maturing Christians, we will experience pain. But as a living sacrifice for God, we must delete superficial pleasures from our lives. We must abandon sinful activity the excessive use of alcohol, drugs, sexual promiscuity, we no longer conform to the patterns of this world. But we become a living sacrifice. And now Paul is juxtaposing this against a dead sacrifice. Uh, because in order, before Christ came, in order for us to be forgiven our sins, and for the sins to be covered, for there to be atonement, you had to bring a sacrifice. So if you were wealthy, you would bring a lamb. And then the priest would go behind the holies of holies. And once he sacrificed the lamb and the blood was shed, then your sins were atoned for. If you were poor like Leroy you, and Joseph and Mary in good company, they came with two turtle doves. 
But in any way, there is no forgiveness of sin without the shedding of blood. This is what this table represents. But Jesus became the perfect, matchless Lamb of God. And when his blood was shed for our sins, it washed away our sins. It did not just cover our sins, but it took the place of any other dead sacrifice. And because of God's mercy and because of what God has done for us through Jesus Christ, we become a living sacrifice. We say, try me now, now and see if I can be completely yours. I'm yours, Lord. I'm yours, Lord. Is your all on the altar of sacrifice laid? Your heart does the spirit control. You can only be blessed and have Rest in sweet peace when you yield him your body and your soul. A living sacrifice. Create within me a clean heart and renew a right spirit in me. A living sacrifice. I don't walk the way I used to walk. I don't talk the way I used to talk, but I'm willing to sacrifice. I'm willing in the cold weather to get myself up by the grace of God and gather in his house and worship him because we're there two or three gathered together. He has promised to meet us here. I'll make a sacrifice. I'll come to my choir rehearsal. I'll come to Sunday school. I'll study God's word. I'll study to show myself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. He says, do not be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. How do you become transformed? Transformation takes place when you study God's word. Transformation takes place when you worship God. Transformation takes place when you praise God. Transformation takes place when you read positive books, such as Don't Sweat the Small Stuff the power of positive thinking. When we do these things, we begin to find that it's easier to hear God's voice. The reality of the matter is that as we concentrate on God's word, then God will guide us more definitively into what his will is for us. Point two, and I'll take my seat. So we need to change our vision, and that's how we do it by not being conformed, but being transformed. We don't do everything because somebody else does it, but we do that which is pleasing in the sight of God. Sometimes people can push us to do something that is not in God's will. Some folk don't like other folk just because your friends don't like them, but if they've not done anything to you, then you ought to show them the love of Christ. We ought to be kind to everybody. Paul says, because he says, um, because this is how we, we, we um, come with a new attitude. And I'll stop here. He says, for by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to you. Paul argues that we should not overestimate ourselves. Everybody is somebody in the kingdom of God. Regardless of your education, uh, it doesn't matter whether you have a GED or a PhD. We're somebody because of what God has done. Don't get all caught up in your status or your position. You might be the commissioner. You might be a president. You might be a vice president in your corporation or in your situation. You might be looked upon with prestige. But in the eyes of God, we're all brothers and sisters in Christ. For out of one blood have God created all of us to dwell together in unity. So we come with a new attitude. When I see you, I see the divinity of God in you because God breathed into you like he breathed into me and we became a living soul and we are what we are because of the grace and mercy of God. You have the job that you have not because you are that great but because of God's grace and mercy. You are here this morning not because you were that good but because one more time he looked 
looked beyond your faults and he saw our needs and gave us another chance. We've got to come with a new attitude. We ought not look down on somebody unless we're looking down to pick them up because where would we be if somebody had not helped us along the way? There is some good in the worst of us and there's some bad in the best of us. But Jesus looks beyond our faults and sees our need. We are all somebody because of Christ Jesus. And so I want to say as I take my seat, as we try to be conformed, transformed to what God would have us to be, let us not be conformed to doing things the way the world does it, but let's do it the way God wants us to do it. Let's come out from amongst them and be ye separate, says the Lord, and you'll be my people. And and I'll be your God. Let's not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, but be willing to tell everybody that it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that will believe. Let's not try to be popular, but let's just try to be in the will of God. Let's be a church that's transformed. Let's be a light seated on a hill, and that when people see us, they will see Jesus. Let your light so shine that men and women might see your good works and glorify God who is in heaven, because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For Christ came not into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Don't be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. And when you get into the sanctuary, and when you just think about what God has done for you, don't worry about who is not praising the Lord. But if he's done something for you, give him the praise, the honor, and the glory, because he inhabits the praises of his people. He is worthy to be praised. I tell you, I was seeking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply staying within, seeking to rise no more. But the master of the seas heard my despairing cry, far from the waters, lifted me, now safe am I. Love lifted me when nothing else could do. God's love lifted me. Give him praise, honor, and glory. I got more, but I give it to you next week. So to this week, if you're taking notes, we want to get a new vision. And then we want to have a new attitude. Next week, we're going to talk about the universal love of God. I'm so glad he doesn't care whether you're fat or skinny, gay or straight ugly or good looking, it doesn't matter to him. We're all somebody in the family of God. I'm so glad that he saves us by his grace and by his mercy. I, 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 I want a church not that's popular. I don't need a church with a whole lot of folk, but I need a church where there's some folk that's been transformed. I've been changed. I know I've been changed. The angels in heaven done changed my name. Uh, my name used to be li liar, but now I speak the truth. Uh -huh. my, my, my name used to be gambler, but now I share God's love with everybody. Um, I, I may have used to be an alcohol, but now I drink fruit juice. Uh, I'm about God's business. My, my body is, is, is the temple of, of the living God. I'm going to be concerned about what I put in this body because we are the church. When, when we show up, that's where the church is. This place is just the place where the church meets. And so when they see me, I want them to see the church. When they see you, I want them to see the church. And things ought to change when we walk into the room because Jesus has showed up. I do believe, I now believe, that Jesus died for me. With his blood, his precious blood, I shall be set free.